today I'll be talking, as sta stated up on the slide, a journey through time, disability histories as agents of change. And of course, uh, a lot of history ha has been written without disabled people in, as being part of it. And yet disabled people are throughout history. You, you, if you just have to um, be able to find places to put, include them in. So, so really it's very important that we include disabled people in our histories much more so than has been done in the past. So this is very much a, a way of helping to do that. And by the way, if you happen to know any in, to graduate students, uh, next year, uh, next academic year, I'm teaching a course called Critical Interpretations of Disability History on Thursdays, 11.30 to 2.30. So uh, you're, they're welcome to take it. So uh, a bit of promotion of my, my course, and I'm very excited. It's one of my favorite courses to, uh, to teach. So, um, so we going through here. Oh, here. This is uh, one of the very first people whose name comes down to us as a disabled person, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he was uh, considered mad. Um, and so it, this is also brings up the issues of ancient others, doesn't it? Very much so uh, throughout history of disabled people being othered. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was in the book of Daniel uh, in the Hebrew Bible in the Christian Old Testament and um, he was cast down from his throne uh, in ancient Babylon uh, because he had the gall to say he was greater than God. So God cast him out amongst the animals. As you can see, he's walking on all fours. Um, and uh, uh, he was uh, cast out for seven years. It was a form of punishment to him. Um, and uh, it's a very famous story. Um, and you can see he, he's, his hands are scaly and, and he's um, uh, sort of cast in an animalistic way. And the, the lesson here is, uh, is that if you were a person with what we would now describe as a disability, uh, in this case, madness, but other type, types of disability as well, um, it was uh, some sort of a, a punishment for something you had said or done, or perhaps some sort of a punishment a relative or a descendant of yours um, had, uh, had done previ in some previous life. And so very much the idea of disability as punishment. And it wasn't until Nebuchadnezzar had repented of his arrogance, said he was not greater than God, and that he was cured of his madness, quote, quote, quote unquote, and put back on the throne and, and a much more humble and supplicant uh, king at that time, at least in relation to, to God. Um, and so that image of, of, mad, of not just madness, but of disability as a punishment from on high is, is a very common theme throughout much of history, not all the time, but for much of that time. And so disability as other and disability as negative is a very, very important um, point to, uh, to emphasize um, that, uh, that, that has come down through history that we've been very much trying to make change, uh, changes towards. Disabled people very much, very much advocating as agents of change to, to challenge these prejudices and stigma of disabled people as, be, as being, uh, uh, people being disabled because of some sort of a punishment from God. And we know there, of course, were many disabled people throughout history. And of course, by the way, when I'm using the term disabled, remember, this is a modern term. Disabled, the term disabled doesn't exist in the Bible, needless to say. Um, uh, lame, the lame, the halt, uh, the, um, a mad, and so forth, um, a blind, um, people with falling disease. Anyone, by the way, know what falling disease it means? The falling sickness, pardon me? Epilepsy, that's right epilepsy, um, so, and so on. So it, these are all in the Bible, but we've now put them under the broad category of disability. So I'm using a very modern term to describe something that uh, is very ancient, but that wasn't used, that those sort of terms weren't used. But certainly we, we know that disability existed in the ancient world. Here we have a Hellenistic or Rome bronze statuette of a person who is, who is a hunchback. Um, there is a person, a small person, dancing dwarf in third century BC, and I apologize for using the term dwarf. It's it, people who are small consider that, consider that term an insult, but that's the term that was used historically. Um, and we always have to revisit these terms, of course, because the language is being re, re, um, revised all the time by the people who lived this history to this day. Um, that's cer certainly something we need to be very uh, um, aware of. Um, this is a depiction of a small person on the va in the vase. You can see the, the man in the middle of the vase in fifth century BCE Greece. Um, this is possibly a terracotta of a person with intellectual disabilities in ancient Greco-Roman Egypt um, that were uh, found in, in the archeological discoveries over the years. Now this is the idealized body, or the, as I, I would say, the disappearing disability. A Roman Emperor Claudius, uh, who ruled from 41 to 54 um, AD, and uh, he succeeded his nephew Caligula, 
Um, and if you know anything about Caligula, who didn't exactly have the greatest reputation, um, he, uh, he was killed by the Praetorian Guard, who were the, literally the, throne, the power behind the throne, and they were killing people, all, a, a whole bunch of people, who at, at the time they killed, at, when they assassinated Caligula, they're killing a whole bunch of members of his family. So Claudius, who was Caligula's uncle, uh, uncle hid, was, so the story goes, hid behind a curtain, and um, to, to escape the murderers, uh, the Praetorian Guard were going around killing everyone, and uh, so they, they, they were looking for him, they, for a reason, and they cast, the story goes, they tore open the, 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 uh, the curtain, and there Cla uh, Claudius was on his knees going like this, begging not to be killed. Instead of, instead of having to beg for his life, the Praetorian Guard then started shouting, Hail Caesar! <laughs> and they, he, what? what? He thought they were going to kill him, and the reason is they were searching him, searching for him because they were, he was the one they decided to put on the throne. Um, and the reason they put him on the throne, they figured he would be easy, an easy emperor. They could control him because he had what we now call uh, having a disability. We're not exactly sure what Claudius's disability was. Um, it could have been a cerebral palsy. It was at the very least um, some sort of a speech disability. Um, it may have been a cleft palate, depends on what sources you read, but he definitely had some sign of visible disability. Um, and so the, the image of him as being, quote unquote, and again, this is offensive term, and I apologize for using events, of being dumb or not being intellectually smart enough to rule uh, was considered a reason why they, they, the Praetorian Guard chose him. As it turned out, he was a much stronger ruler, or more ruthless, that could be another term for strong, ruler than, than they expected. Um, and um, he, uh, he actually uh, was able to get somewhat away from the Praetorian Guard. I won't go into the whole history of Claudius, but the point is that when you look at his, his body, you don't see any image of him being disabled, but apparently he was visibly, physically disabled. So we have to also be aware that in history, a lot of the images that, uh, that were depicted are, are are falsely um, used or not accurately recorded, certainly of the big and high and mighty figures as well. Um, but it's also important to emphasize how many, uh, le some leaders were also disabled um, and uh, that, that was also used to stigmatize them. Uh, I was using a, a, a text written by someone in the early 20th century who was making dis derogatory remarks about Claudius based on his dis presumed disability in, in another course. And, and so these, these images come all down through, through time, um, but it's very important to emphasize that throughout history there have been disabled people um, in, in society, generally speaking, and even in positions of power, um, even though often that disability history has sometimes been written out of the record, and in some cases literally carved out of the record in terms of his actual stat statue. Um, generally speaking, in ancient times, it needs to be emphasized, there are huge numbers of disabled people who are much more integrated in society than we think. We got to remember um, that disabled people were very common in society. It was very common, mostly because it was agrarian society, it was very common for people to get disabilities. For example, eye disability, it was very common for people to get eye infections, and they didn't, they didn't have Visine in ancient medieval times, needless to say. They, they, you, you would get eye infections and people could go, go blind or have, some, or have uh, different disabilities uh, of the eye uh, that was common. Someone would be working in an agricultural field, they'd fall down in their work, they would get a dislocated leg, and they would be physically disabled. And yet they were integrated in different ways. They would do other parts of the work. That was, most families didn't have the option of saying, okay, we'll, you can't work for us, you can't do any work for now we will uh, shunt you off to a, a social service agency, which of course didn't exist, needless to say, before the mid 20th century. Um, so they integrated most people with disabilities in the household economy in some ways. So disabled people really weren't segregated out of work and employment. Generally speaking, if they lived with families, um, in terms of people with physical uh, disabilities or even sensory disabilities until well into the 19th century. In ancient histories, you see all kinds of people with disabilities were incorporated into household economies as far as the records tell. Of course, it's very hard to find a lot of material because huge much of this history isn't recorded. But that's very important to emphasize. So we got to remember, disabled people were othered if they were born, if it was considered congenital in some ways. But on the other hand, if it was considered acquired, where they had a disability such as an eye disease, which was very common, or a physical disability because of working in the in the um, household or in the, in the farm or what have you, it wasn't considered that unusual. So it, was, it wasn't um, 
segregated. And so we have, of course, all sorts of images of disabled people also being um, healed. And so the image of overcoming a disability is very famous. And here we have Jesus healing a mad woman. And the woman who is in the film, or sorry, in the image, is she's got her hands over her eyes. And so remember, in preliterate society, uh, images like this told messages to people who couldn't read, uh, the vast majority of people who couldn't read. So it was un universally understood that someone with their, a woman with their hands over her eyes, like that was mad. Um, so that was a very, very common image. And also, so the image also of healing uh, disabled people was very important during this period. Not just mad people, but of course, Jesus making the lame walk is a very famous story, isn't it, from the New Testament. So uh, this comes down as well throughout history, and it changed from uh, from the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, where there's much more emphasis on, on um, disabled people as being segregated in, 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 from uh, the temples, for example, uh, and not being welcomed into the temple, but we're, we're very much more of a charitable impulse. So that's important to, to emphasize during this period. Uh, and that came up very much when plague and disability occurred. Um, where there was much more of an emphasis to take care of people who were uh, considered what we would now call disabled. Uh, and that was very much focused on the, on the writings of, of the church leaders in, in Christianity. Also, it was also partly a history of, in Judaism and Islam, there was also a long history of charitable um, efforts towards uh, people who are disadvantaged. But in, plague was very important during this period, of course, because plague was a ca catastrophic, had a catastrophic impact in ancient medieval Europe, especially medieval Europe in, uh, uh, from 1348 to 51, uh, anywhere from a third to a half of the population of Europe died, didn't they, during the Black Plague, one of the greatest catastrophes in, in, in European history. And so just imagine a third to a half of the population of Toronto dying in the next three years. I think we'd be pretty frightened. And of course, we have many more explanations. People didn't know what was going on. They literally thought it was the end of the world. It probably would have too. And for many people, it was the end of the world. They died. Um, and so it's, uh, it was a terrifying time. And so um, the people literally fled from the towns into the countryside during the plague. It's when uh, outside of London in 1630. Um, and people were also stigmatized. Sometimes people were blamed for it. Jews were often blamed for the plague and anti-Semitic prejudices, um, as were, were some disabled people for spreading the plague. Um, and some were burned at the, at the stake. Um, and of course, the, uh, particularly older um, women were, uh, who were called spinsters were often um, blamed as well, and were often burned at the stake uh, during this period, the medieval period. It's roughly considered about 200,000 uh, women were, uh, uh, people were burned at the stake, mostly women, during the 14 to 1600 period, um, for, who were considered uh, to have caused various um, supernatural, unexplained occurrences, such as the plague, but also it could be something going wrong in the local community. Um, and they were all very much stigmatized. So it was very common during this period for, uh, for people to be burned at the stake who were considered othered, and especially um, older women who were considered ex eccentric in some way, and would some of whom were now recognized as probably someone who had psychological or psychiatric, mental health disabilities or intellectual disabilities, or just people who are different in some way. Just, some way socially nonconformist. Um, and so it, that's, uh, this is a, a, an image from medieval, the medieval times of, of the, the moon literally hitting women on the head from the devil in the moon. So it's, it's the devil in the moon. The half crescent moon is, a, 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 um, is, is a, the Luna, of course, and ancient god of, of uh, Roman ancient god of the moon is Luna. And so that's where the word lunatic comes. The Luna ticks you on the head, so you're lunatic. So that's, uh, that's literally the word, that's where that term comes from, a, a lunatic. And so it wasn't any mistake that this medieval image is hitting women on the head because they were often considered more prone to being uh, possessed by the devil and therefore more likely to be um, burned at the stake as a result. Um, although there was also exorcism, which is another whole issue. There was also burning of people with leprosy in 14th century Germany. A leprosy has been probably one of the most stigmatized disabilities throughout history, to this day, isn't it? Very much so. Um, and so uh, very much of, 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 of and of course, that comes through in the Bible, unclean, someone being made clean, the, just the very image of clean and unclean, which is very stigmatizing to people with leprosy. Um, and um, so they were often bur burned at the stake and were also blamed for spreading the plague. Um, people who are blind, um, uh, who have leprosy, is as, uh, depicted as uh, begging for death. This is a, a detail from a, um, um, a, a painting from Florence in the 1350s. 
And so uh, they, they were, it was also the image that disabled people, why, why, they wouldn't want to live. If you were disabled, you'd not naturally, you, who would want to live with a disability? This, this, the prejudice uh, was commonly touted. Uh, you would rather beg for death. So this is the image that's been promoted here. And it's something that disabled people, of course, have been challenging for many, many um, centuries uh, as well. Um, and so this is the first public health measures directed towards people with disability it was a plague doctor. Um, and uh, hello. Um, and uh, this was uh, the, the early quarantine suits. We, now, we all remember SARS, I'm sure. Um, and uh, uh, of just 2003, uh, 13 years ago, wasn't it? Right at this time in Toronto. And so the, the quarantine outfits that people had to wear in the hospitals and so forth, this is the, a, a precursor to that. Um, and so it was very much uh, used to, to try to help people uh, with, who are disabled by plague at this time. But at the same time, it was also a way of making people frightened of disabled people. So it, it was, it was uh, contradictory because people would often be walled up, literally walled up in their houses until they died because people were so frightened of the plague. Um, and so there was all of these images of dis disablement as being not just othered, but literally as a contagion that you could get from other people um, and as a sickness that should be avoided at all costs. Um, so the charitable impulse I referred to earlier in the Christian faith, but also certainly belongs in the Islamic faith and and, and uh, um, Jewish faith and amongst others. Uh, there's very important for having uh, important development of hospitals and the development of charities and religious facility for people with disabilities in, in the great creation of uh, hospitals in, in ancient and in medieval times, the Hotel Dues of, uh, you heard of Hotel Dues? The hospital, God's Hospital, it's uh, um, uh, created in France in the, in the seventh century. It's right, there's one that's, it's not the original one, right near the, uh, uh, Notre Dame in Paris, if you go to Notre Dame, the, the Hotel Du is right just off to the side there. Um, not the original one, but it's still the, on the same, the original site. Now, mind you, hospitals are also a place of great fear. You, do, you generally didn't go to a hospital unless you were gonna, basically going to die. They were places of great contagion as well, because they didn't have very good um, uh, sterilization or anything like that, which didn't come up, which they didn't, uh, medical science didn't recognize the importance of sterilization until the mid uh, to late 19th century. So during this period, it was common, someone would die and they'd use the same bed sheets and put the next person in there as well. Um, but usually it was, it was very much a place also where disabled people went who had nowhere else to go. Um, St. Vincent de Paul was probably the most famous Catholic saint who very much promoted uh, in, in 17th century France taking disabled people off the street and at least giving them a place to die in these hospitals. Um, and so there, there is a, a, a long history as well of, of um, hospitals as, as basically what we would now call hospices, even though they, they weren't considered that as such, but they, they were places where people would go to die, and m most of whom were disabled people who were in their last stages, many of whom were homeless and left uh, literally on the street. Um, and so here, um, the, the, during the medieval period, most people, if you were disabled, unless you had a family to take care of you, 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 were, you weren't in, 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 were not able to get much support um, from, uh, from um, elsewhere outside of the church. The church would be one of the other, few other places. But you, 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 if your family came from a well-to-do background, they could perhaps provide some sort of financial support to go to somewhere like a prayer chapel. And so there were places for people who were mad, such as uh, Margaret A. Sela, Seleus. I'm sure I'm not saying her name right. She was an actual person. She lived in uh, the early 1500s, 500 years ago, and she was mad. And her, her father was the burgermeister of a, of a town in Bavaria. And he, they brought her to the prayer chapel where she was chained, as you can, uh, I think, there, oh, yes, you can see uh, uh, right uh, there, she has a chain on her, she, they put a chain on her leg to, to keep her um, from going. And then in the, in the corner, you can see the, uh, the lay person uh, praying for her. You, usually it'd be a nun, but she's obviously not a nun. She doesn't have a habit on. But um, so um, they would have pay someone to pray for the person to get over their illness or their madness as it was construed at that time. And so this was the, 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 both the best treatment one could expect if you were from the upper class during this period. For the lower classes, uh, there, this was the pre-confinement area. P people lived in the community at that time. Um, they were very often wandering the streets or lived with their families. Uh, at this time in the Eastern Orthodox Church, um, people who were mad were often made or sometimes made into saints. There's a history of fools in, um, and fools were considered a positive 
uh, aspect of of, uh, of being having some sort of divine um, um, uh, message from God. Um, so there's this whole series of saints called fools, uh, or fools for Christ, as Saint Paul was called uh, many centuries earlier. Um, that uh, that that there's a long history of that. So there was some positive interpretations of disability, generally speaking, but ge but they were few and far between. Most people were treated poorly, including even from the upper class. So if you can imagine uh, Margaret being treated this badly, this, this way, chained in a prayer cell, you can imagine, or maybe we really can't imagine, but you can just at least think of how, how awful it would have been for the poorest people who had no means of support. Klaus Narr um, was a person with what we would now recognize as having an intellectual disability. He was a real person who lived. He, he, he lived 500 years ago in, in Bavaria. Uh, unfortunately, his name has since come to be used as a pejorative. To be a nar in Germany apparently still means to be a, a fool. Um, so his name has come, come, come down in, apparently in popular German culture to be used in, in an insulting way. Um, but he really lived and he was a, 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 a what would be called, considered a fool, a court fool. Uh, during this period, um, and so uh, so too were Balakana and Markov. They were mocked bodies. They had, um, they, they, you can see their hair was adorned with sticks and leaves, and that was because they were considered natural fools or people with intellectual disabilities. And there are various sorts of categories for fools in disability history. Um, natural fools for people with intellectual disabilities, mad fools, people with what we now call psychiatric disabilities. Again, all these terms, of course, are, are modern terms. Uh, that are coming along with uh, intellectual, uh, with disabilities. Cripple fools, obviously people with physical disabilities and artificial fools or gesture, people with disabilities who dressed up as w one or more of the above to imitate and mock them. So when you see a clown in the, in the circus or a gesture, that comes right out of disability history. Comes out of the history of, of people dressing up to imitate people with disabilities um, as, as different and as somebody to mock. Now, of course, th there are some historians such as H.K. Eric Middleford, who's done a lot of this history and from which I've got, gotten a lot of information from on this topic, uh, who's done histories of this. We also wrote about how fools were allowed to speak truth to power that nobody else could do. So for example, Klaus Narr or, or um, somebody else who was considered a mad fool or a crippled fool. Again, these are offensive terms. And I apologize for using terms like crippled, which is certainly offensive to uh, disabled people, generally speaking, um, uh, that, that nevertheless, uh, they would, they would be able to speak truth to power in a way that wouldn't be, they wouldn't be punished, uh, generally speaking, um, because they were considered uh, to be not responsible for their behavior, generally speaking. So was the stereotype. Um, but nevertheless, they were treated in a very poor manner, it has to be said, by those who owned them, who were the, the aristocracy or the church leaders at, at the time. Um, and um, they, they lived in, in a way that was also very denigrating, wasn't it? Because people came, it would be in effect, I'm here, you're the audience, uh, let's say at a court uh, of medieval Europe, and you're all laughing at me because of what I'm saying. Well, obviously it's very insulting. So, um, uh, so we have to be aware that they were treated in a very uh, poor and derogatory and insulting manner. Uh, even if they were given shelter by the aristocracy and rich, um, they, it was only to serve the, the, uh, the purposes of, of using them uh, in a way that was considered entertainment. Um, that was hardly would have been hardly entertaining for the people who were treated like that. Um, and so, of course, most famously, Foucault wrote about ships of fools going from harbor to harbor uh, to find a place of entry. Um, historians have since found, like Middlefort, who I quoted a moment ago, was perhaps most famous for saying actually these ships of fools never existed in reality, um, but they probably they more existed as a metaphor. In other words, disabled people not being welcomed in the community unless they already happen to be living there themselves, but not going from one place to the other um, as, uh, and looking for, for shelter. Um, the Taunted Dwarfs, this is, gives a much better example of what it was like to live in the community, which is where most people with disabilities live in the pre-confinement area in their own local community. Remember in pre-industrial area, most people, not just disabled people, most people were poor agricultural workers who didn't go much farther than their own village for most of their life. That was, uh, most of our ancestors would have been farmers, certainly mine were. Uh, my grandparents were all, and their descendants were all farmers. So it's, uh, most people, certainly hundreds of years ago, before uh, the pre-industrial era, uh, uh, before the 1800s, would have uh, just been in the local community. So this is what it would have been like for disabled people to be, to literally be taunted, taunted, insulted, chased, laughed at, 
Uh, it's, it would have been a living uh, hell of, often. It was very unpleasant to say the least. And there are, of course, gender dimensions, which are when you consider um, uh, the experiences of women with disabilities or girls with disabilities as being in many ways more uh, oppressive than that which, which males experience as well, because there was also issues around sexual harassment and abuse that occurred that could also happen to males as well, but more uh, frequently towards females uh, that happened. And so there was uh, all sorts of, of issues that come up around the way in which people with disabilities were treated. There were sometimes privileged groups of disabled people, few and far behind, such as in the marriage of people with disabilities at the court of Peter the Great in, in Russia in 1712. Um, he again kept a, a group of people with disabilities, small people with disabilities um, uh, as sort of entertainment or as jesters. And sometimes there was a, a, an impulse to keep, when I say keep people with disabilities, house people with disabilities by the rich and famous to show that, them as being um, uh, uh, um, uh, responding to the, uh, the Christian charitable impulse of, of, of providing shelter to those who are more disadvantaged. Um, but it was, it was often, very often self-interest. Um, of which, by the way, St. Vincent de Paul was a very good critic of it. He, he was a very strong critic of, of the hypocrisy of the aristocracy on these sorts of issues, um, which is interesting to, to read about. Um, but uh, there, so there are all sorts of examples of this from medieval history and early modern history. And here we have the maids of honors in Spain, Diego de Velazquez. Um, and you can see uh, these uh, small people who are uh, in the painting by Velasquez, uh, Velasquez, and so um, so it's uh, uh, there. There were some disabled people who were who were kept um, as uh, as members of the local courts, but generally speaking, that w this was the more common experience for disabled people in ancient and medieval period. And this is the number one job disabled people have had throughout all of history: begging. Uh, Judy, you and I were talking just before. You were talking about. Uh, you were tripped to recently to India of, of, of seeing the people with disabilities begging on the streets. And to this day, people beg in many parts of the world, don't, don't, don't we very much so? And so it's very common in this painting by Pieter Bruegel, the elder um, of disabled people begging. Uh, that's the number one job disabled people could ever get, um, uh, was to try to survive by begging. Um, and so uh, this is, this, if we talk about employment, if you're writing a history of employment of dis disabled people, this is where you start as uh, the, 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 the preeminent work that disabled people um, were allowed, if you will, to, uh, to have. There are also disabled people who formed uh, or, or took roles in their local community uh, of, uh, of, of, of being part of certain ceremonies, and in this case, John Donaldson in Edinburgh, Scotland, in the early 1700s, he was a person with intellectual disability uh, in the just pre-industrial period in, in Scotland at that time, just before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And he would walk behind funerals. And it was a socially accepted part of, uh, of, the, uh, of, uh, of, of the Edinburgh society at this time that John Donaldson, for whatever reason, we don't really know how it began or why, but it was accepted that this man would, would um, um, he would walk behind funeral cortages. So, uh, and th that was for as long as he apparently was able to do so. So there were some people who were considered ex socially acceptable in, in small little areas. And of course the term, and again, I apologize in advance, but I'm sure you've all heard of this term, the village idiot, which is a grotesquely insulting term, but it's a term that, that encapsulates people with intellectual, what we now see people with intellectual disabilities who were part of the local community in some way very often harassed, had a, usually a life of extreme poverty and degradation, but would rely, live on hand of, of, of charitable um, provisions or begging. Uh, or as in the case of John Donaldson, he would walk behind the, the funeral cortages at uh, different places. Um, Victor, the wild boy of Arion, is uh, very important. Um, he was found as uh, around 12 or 13, they're not sure of course of exactly how old he was, but he was found in, in um, 1801, um, France, uh, and, and, and he was, uh, it, it was it, 1785 is the question mark. We, don't, we really don't know how old he was when he was found. Uh, but he was found by Jean Etard, um, and, um, or actually he was found by some farmers. I, I take it back. Um, he was living with animals in the forest uh, in Avignon, uh, France, and um, he was uh, 
naked and, and, and was howling and living with the animals. The animals clearly accepted him as part of their community. Um, and so they took him, the farmers took him into the town and eventually Jean Nétard, who was a famous um, teacher in Paris, took him under his wing. And he was the first one to develop what we would now call special education for people with uh, dis disabilities or learning disabilities or intellectual disabilities. There's been huge critiques of Jean Etard, which I don't have time to get into here, but he's been very much critiqued for the way he treated or mistreated um, uh, 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 um, Victor, um, and how little was written about um, his servant, the woman servant who, um, who took care of, of Victor. And so she's kind of been written out of the history so much so we know virtually nothing about her relationship, but apparently he got along, Victor got along with much more with his, his household servant than he did with, uh, with Jean Etard. But Etard is, is basically the, f the founder, if you will, of special education in, in, in um, Western Europe and North America. But he's been very heavily criticized for the way, the harsh way he treated, uh, treated Victor. And there is lots of histories of, of other people, uh, small children being found in, in, um, uh, in forests and other places who had been abandoned by their parents and raised by animals, or raised, lived with animals, as uh, Etard did. And what, um, I, sorry, as Victor did. Um, and so there's other examples of this as well during this period. Um, and of course, displaying people with disabilities is, is a very common theme of our history too. Tom Thumb, or Charles Stratton was his name, Tom Thumb, here he is meeting Queen Victoria and Prince uh, Albert um, in London. And uh, he was very famous. In fact, his marriage, uh, when he and his, um, his wife, I'm sorry, I can't remember, I apologize, speaking of taking people out of history, I should remember his wife's name, but they were married and it was made a big, literally a circus event by P.T. Barnum, who, who, uh, who had the huge um, display of their, of their wedding. Um, of course, the argument has been often also made by disabled people that some people with disabilities used their being put on display in what were called freak shows, and again, very offensive terms, as a form of agency. You all probably heard of as the Elephant uh, Man. Um, it was a very famous um, show, a movie, but that's been very heavily critiqued as well. The doctor is portrayed as a great saint. And in fact, he's been very heavily critiqued as well by disability history scholars as having used, um, a, 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 oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name. I sh I'm embarrassed. Merrick. I, pardon me? Merrick. Merrick, there, thank you. Uh, um, uh, Merrick um, for, uh, for exploiting him for his own medical purposes uh, and uh, not remembering, uh, not in acknowledging the fact that he was uh, his own person, putting him on display at different times. And of course, the argument is Merrick uh, committed suicide at the end. He wasn't supposed to lie down because he would, he would choke on his own fluid, but that's what he eventually did after four years of living with the, the doctor who's portrayed as a saint in the film, The Elephant Man. But it, it, disability history scholars um, have written very different interpretations of how his role in, in treating uh, John Merrick. Um, so, um, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's uh, it, uh, um, a lot of different interpretations. There's also lots of issues around race and disability. Freak shows, again, a very offensive term. You can't really see Henry Johnson here, but uh, here, here, here's Henry Johnson here. He's an African-American man. Um, who had an intellectual disability, who was put on display and was dressed literally in an ape co costume. So huge bigotry on issues around race and huge bigotry around people with intellectual disabilities, literally put on display in these um, freak shows. Um, but there have been scholars such as Robert Bogdan who have argued that the, the so-called freak shows also allowed some disabled people to have, have a degree of agency, of so, sort of self-employment. Um, how far that went, for example, for someone like Henry Johnson, who is clearly exploited, uh, is a, a whole other question, too. So it's a, a very contentious issue. But the whole history of freak shows, quote unquote, freak shows has been used, um, has been uh, examined by all sorts of scholars uh, and critiqued from various per perspectives. Of course, the 19th century was the rise of institutional confinement, wasn't it? Uh, that began in, in the 18th century, and there were uh, some asylums that went back even to the 15th century, such as Bedlam, or Royal Bethlehem Hospital. Bedlam, by the way, comes from the term Bethlehem. It was corrupted in the, uh, into the word Bedlam, uh, excuse me, which of course now means chaos. But that was very, very uh, few people with disabilities or mad people went into Bethlehem during its history until the 1800s. Very few people with disabilities were confined, whether they were mad or having any other disability, until the 1800s. It was very, very um, seldom happened. It was really the, it, with the rise of industrialization and urbanization 
that it came to a much greater extent. So I have up here this picture of um, St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., or sorry, Bethesda, outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and this is the, the plans for the asylum. Uh, you can see it's, it's huge grounds, but it's also important, again, for around race and disability. These literally, uh, pr this is, of course, pre-welfare state. So remember, people who are at the front of the, of the asylum, of the, of the institutions, had literally um, better treatment. The further back you went, the worse off you the Back wards literally have, you've heard of back wards, uh, I'm sure. They have a very justifiably horrible reputation. Literally, the further back you went, the worse off you were. The closer you were to the front, you were a paying patient. Your family or your, somehow your estate or whatever was able to pay a certain amount. And so um, if you're really lucky, you had your own private room, but more often it was semi-private. But most, the vast majority of, of people who ended up in these institutions were poor people who had no money and were on very crowded, wretchedly um, miserable uh, wards. So the further back you went, the worse off you were. But especially if you, your skin color was not white, and here is the, co the lodge for colored women, and here is the lodge for colored men. They were way, way, there's been studies done, uh, being done on the treatment of African Americans in the United States during this time. It was, it was dreadful, far worse than even the worst conditions for white patients, um, much more overcrowded and um, abusive uh, for, for uh, African Americans. And just so we're not uh, too smug to think, oh, it didn't happen in Canada. Actually, it did in BC. And uh, uh, Robert Menzies, a professor in uh, Simon Fraser, has done research and found that there, uh, Canadians of Chinese background were, uh, were put on segregated wards in the 19th century. They were eventually integrated into the, uh, the general population in, by the early 20th century, but they were given the worst jobs to do as well. So lots of, and of course, uh, the treatment of uh, Aboriginal Canadians uh, has also uh, a long and a discreditable history of people with, if, this, if there's an area that re needs a lot of research in Canadian disability history as well, by the way, it's the history of treatment of Aboriginals with disabilities. Um, so there's been enormous amount that needs to be done in this, uh, this area as well. So huge amounts of research needs to be done in, in these different areas. But this gives you an idea of the, the dreadful treatment of uh, people with disabilities in, in these institutions, especially based on, on race and of course, gender. Uh, uh, as well, and, and class, needless to say, all go together. Um, and this is the Provincial Lunatic Asylum in Toronto, 999. It opened 1841. It moved to this site in Queen Street, 1850, which is to this there, there to this day, Cam H. Cam H. Yes, Center for Addiction and Mental Health. That's right. I volunteer there. That's why. Okay. Yeah. This is the precursor to Cam H. So this picture was taken uh, almost 150 years ago, 148 years ago. Uh, of uh, what, it, what that, the old building looked like to this day uh, at that time. And they tore the, that building down in the 1970s. Um, there's also the Ontario School for the Blind in Brantford is opened in 1872, um, which uh, that, that school is still there. And um, the, lots of different schools for the blind existed in different places and in, in different in institutions. And they also have a history of abuse as well. Uh, the Jericho Beach one in Vancouver, there was lawsuits around the mistreatment of people. So the, the history of these institutions have a very sordid history of confinement and of abuse of people with disabilities. Um, Aurelia has been very much in the news, or Heronia has been very much in the news recently, hasn't it? For the lawsuit settlement there and what they plan to do with the actual remains of the, the grounds and, and the institutions today. It's very controversial, it was just in the paper the other day. So these, these places are, have, have a very unpleasant history in, in many, many, um, many parts of, of our history. But there are also others who would argue that they are also placed where some sorts, forms of community were formed um, and some education was provided. So there is a learning braille at Brantford in 1936. So some people have also written about uh, how there were communities in, uh, formed there, particularly for people who were um, who are deaf. There's been a, an argument by some scholars who've written uh, about this topic in the United States uh, uh, and, um, and, and that the schools for people who are deaf also allow people to form um, common cause with one another. The first time groups of people who were deaf, for example, were gathered together collectively were in these institutions. And so um, that, that led to greater political activism and, and awareness amongst different people who are trying to make changes, and particularly fighting against oralism. Um, during the, from the 1880s to about the 1960s, there was a very much emphasis of lip reading, um, and that was a, a way of trying to stamp out 
um, sign language amongst people who are deaf. And there's a long history of that, uh, that it's considered a very oppressive part of, of deaf people's history during this period. But a lot of deaf people fought this as well. So it wasn't just monolithic where they all had to lip read. There are lots of people who resisted that and insisted they still be agents of change, if you will, and refused to, uh, um, to, to lip read and insisted on um, signing. And so to, this, to now, thanks to those efforts of deaf people, signing is considered universal. Oralism has gone by the wayside very much so and is largely discredited. And um, so sign language is considered as much a, a, a different language as, say, French or English or German or what have you. It's just considered a cultural, um, a different cultural expression. Um, and uh, that's th very much thanks to the efforts of, of people who are deaf. Industrial, uh, who, who fought oralism or, or, uh, over this many years. Industrial work and disability is a long history as well. Disabled people were put to, to work in institutions and also at um, vocational rehabilitation uh, uh, workshops out in the community. This is an industrial training school in, in New York around 1920. Um, New York State. Um, so lots of people with disabilities, of course, were, pr were provided with work, quote unquote, in the industrialized economy where they were um, expected to produce uh, as disabled bodies in, in a ways that didn't exist in the pre-industrial world. I talked about that before, about how pre in, in the pre-industrial world, disabled people were part of the household economy. That ended very much so, certainly in terms of the wider economy uh, in the industrial age. And disabled people were expected to be very much producing if they were to be of any use, quote unquote. And again, I put that in, in quotes, and I know it's very offensive terms, but um, they were considered to be able to have to produce in some ways. And so they were put to work in different sorts of workshops, such as this place here um, and other places, and, and it very po paid very poor, low wages during this time. Um, and so this idea of disabled people as being a drain on the economy very much influenced immigration policies, didn't it? That's as you see in the next slide. Um, and uh, uh, very, very uh, um, uh, negative perceptions of disabled people to this day. There's a colleague right here, uh, Philippe Montoya, who has had to fight right now uh, disabled, uh, the, the prejudices in uh, uh, Canada, uh, uh, the immigration policy, because his son, Nico, uh, Nicholas has an intellectual disability, so they, they were going to toss him out of the country because um, they thought he would be too much of a drain. And if I may be a bit personal, my wife, Esther, um, Esther Jun, she is from uh, South Korea. Her family was originally turned down and when they came from South Korea in, in, in 19, to her, kind of trying to get, come here in 92 uh, because she has cerebral palsy. And uh, the conservative government at that time thought she would be a drain. So the whole sh the family was they, she was turned down. The family stayed in South Korea. They came after Kretchen came to, came into office. They were allowed to come into the country. So I need to say they her family likes Jean Kretchen a lot, and quite <laughs> rightly so. Um, but uh, but it shows literally it's at the whim of the government. Uh, as she was she was turned down because she had CP. Yeah, by the way, she ended up getting three degrees and was the first woman with CP to get a law degree in BC. So so much for the. Um, so much for the, uh, the views of, uh, thank you. So much, thank you, I'll tell Esther you clap, she'll be very happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and so, uh, yes, very proud of her. Um, and so, uh, so it just shows uh, these prejudices are, are so uh, uh, false and how that much damage they've done to people. And here, people are being, are being checked for eye, supposed eye, uh, uh, eye disabilities. And, and further on, uh, they're, they're being also screening new immigrants for disability here. And uh, you can imagine getting off the boat after weeks on a boat in steerage. You're exhausted. You don't know the language, most likely. Uh, you're, it's gonna pre and then you're interviewed about private things in front of a room of people. I mean, it's pretty distressing, wouldn't it? <laughs> so you can imagine how often people would fail, would, wouldn't pass these, I shouldn't say fail, but wouldn't pass these interviews for all kinds of reasons. But there, you can see here, this man has a, an X marked on his shoulder. That means the immigration officer said, there's something to, it, it's the, that's, he's telling the customs officer, pay special attention to this person. There may, there's something suspicious about him. But this poor fellow here, he has an X with an O circle. That means forget it. Don't waste your time. Send him right away to the, to the quarantine hospital. He's going to be deported. Don't even waste your time interviewing him. So once he gets there, the guy is probably going to just basically send him on. That's, so very, uh, uh, um, very upsetting uh, way in which people, and this is the psychopathic board for people waiting 
quote unquote psychopath, avoiding deportation on Ellis Island. Um, and of course, we had similar ones here, didn't we, at Pier 21 in Halifax and so on. So it's not like it didn't exist here. And of course, eugenics and the, the preservation of a species from a, quote unquote 1880s to the present, um, very common of disabled people being rated according to their supposed intellectual or, dis, or physical um, or, or sensory abilities. And in this case, a better baby contest was, was, was promoted in Kansas. Um, very much prejudiced views towards disabled babies, right from, baby, from babyhood, whether or not you are considered to meet the grade, so to speak. Um, lots of, 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 of prejudices around class, disability, and, and literally how you looked um, as, a, as a person. Um, you can see in this case, this is a picture from a poster from Cincinnati, um, where this man, his image, just the image, the way he's looked, he's, he's kind of looks um, sort of uh, a stereotypical view of a person with a, 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 um, a, a, what would one consider to be feeble-minded, which is, a, by the way, a catch-all term. Um, but a, a, the spokes around him, the circle around him, points that basically he's a, a cause of vice, of, of crime, of delinquency, of all sorts of problems. So it's all his fault. There's no social causes. It's just the individual's fault. So it, it's very much blaming the individual rather than the way in which society treats disabled people. Um, and The Black Stork is a fa infamous film from 1917, again, around race and disability. Um, disabled uh, children who, have, uh, who are African-American were portrayed in a very other sort of context. And again, the message of this film by Dr. Hen Harry Hazelden was basically disabled people shouldn't be allowed to exist in our society. And he practiced that very much. Do I just have a few more minutes left? Okay. Okay. Okay, very good. So I'll just go quickly through the gender and disability, uh, disabled people, women in particular, were sterilized, and that happened here in Canada, as we know. Um, Emma Buck uh, and Carrie and Emma Buck, Carrie Buck was sterilized in 1927, and so over 60,000 people were sterilized in the United States, and um, several thousand, uh, just under 3,000 in Alberta and a few hundred in BC. Um, people with intellectual disabilities were literally graded. Uh, the sterilization w w took its most horrific examples in Nazi Germany. Sterilization, not punishment, but liberation was the image used in 1936. We know about half a million people with disabilities were forcibly sterilized there. Almost 200 people with disabilities were murdered in Nazi-occupied Europe, probably more. We know more now about Eastern Europe. The, those archives were closed from 1939 to 45. So that was the most horrific expression of a lot of these prejudices, of course. Um, that uh, happened. Um, and of course, the charity to disability benefits. Begging for a living is a common theme in this history. Arthur Fuller in New York City begged to, to live, and he had a, a person with physical disability. Uh, to, to, literally, you had to have a license and say that you were blind, as this unnamed woman from 1960 New York, 1916 New York did. Um, and rehab, Voc Rehab started for people with disabilities and, and um, in workshops for training people with disabilities. And there were also prosthetic limbs, poster childs uh, for people with disability. Polio was a major theme of, uh, here's the boy, uh, Do Donald Anderson. He was forlorn behind the crib. And then the March of Dimes cured him, quote unquote, and he comes marching forward to a bright future. Of course, we know a lot of this was not really accurate. Um, the huge barriers continued in society and people with polio um, uh, continued to have a, a great deal of discrimination uh, towards them and in different contexts. And, and of course, people who are blind, this is a different kind of ad, disabled protest by workers who are blind in Ireland in 1939, um, who fought against their horrible workplace conditions. Unfortunately, they didn't succeed in, in getting um, uh, their, um, their, what, the, what they asked for. Um, so these efforts continued well into the late 70s. In my last slides here, before we can ask, you can ask some questions, a picture of C.C. Weeks in 1978 Berkeley. She protests the inaccessible theater show of Coming Home, ironically, a film about a disabled Vietnam veteran she couldn't get into. She's in a wheelchair. So they're protesting the absurdity and hypocrisy of this. And so disabled people very much throughout this period, have been throughout this history, have been very much acting as agents of change. The last slide I'll be showing you is Justin Clark's triumph in 1982, where he he's a person with cerebral palsy and he fought um, having to stay in an institution against the wishes of his father and he was able to live out in the community uh, which I understand from a former student of our program he still he continues to live out in the community to this day um, so it was a very important 
triumphant. It raises the whole issue, deinstitutional or, or transinstitutionalization. People going from large scale institutions since the 60s and 70s to smaller scale institutions, but nevertheless institutions such as boarding houses and nursing homes. Um, how many people are actually able to live full lives out in the community that they may wish to do, as happened fortunately for Justin Clark, but the question is how many others do? So uh, this, is a, this is something that disabled people have been fighting for many um, decades and centuries to, as agents of change to, to challenge these prejudices in their communities um, and in their countries and society at large, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions you may have. So thanks very much. Thank you.